welcome everybody to uh, the Winning Minds uh, show. We are an inspirational storytelling network and a part of uh, the Women Inspiring Network, which is a pay it forward movement, which has already gathered in the last uh, five to six months, more than 10 million views of uh, uh, women, um, viewers, listeners from uh, all walks of life. And our whole idea and aim is to create communities and create content, which can both in inform as well as inspire people who tune in. As part of this Winning Minds is a series to uh, speak with and document the work of talented authors, women who've really found passion and purpose through their voices uh, in different formats of uh, writing. Uh, whether it is the written word, the spoken word, uh, videos, blogs, blogs, and so on. But essentially, like, you know, women who are making a difference using words, creativity, and the voice and the power that of that voice. Today, I would love to welcome Sunetra Gupta. Sunetra is a novelist. Uh, Sunetra, first of all, welcome. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. So Sunetra, let me just give you a very quick background. Uh, she's a novelist and she's a professor of um, theoretical epidemiology at uh, Oxford, where among many interesting things in the last few weeks and months, uh, she's been at the center of the conversation around COVID-19 and uh, the spread of the virus and like you know, the uh, immunity factors around it and so on. And I'm sure like, you know, maybe she'll touch upon some of those aspects of her life and her work uh, as we speak. But today we are here because she's in her author hat speaking with us. As a novelist, she's written five works of fiction. Um, so uh, before like, you know, that, just a little bit about her background that she grew up in Kolkata, but has lived and worked in multiple different countries and continents. Um, she has won awards on the science side, but she's also been shortlisted for the Crossword Award, longlisted for the Orange Prize, the Southern Arts Literature Prize, Sahitya Academy Award, she's uh, been a winner of that, and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. And her books are Memories of Rain, The Glass Blower's Breath, Moonlight into Marzipan, A Sin of Color, and So Good in Black. And along with these novels, she also has a body of work which comprises of essays, of uh, like, you know, like um, scientific uh, publications and articles, and so on. So again, with that, like, you know, welcome, Sunetra. And as we uh, begin our conversation today, I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, to start with, tell us a little bit, bit about your journey and the journey that sort of led you onto the path of uh, balancing both creativity and science. So what were some of your early motivations, inspirations, which actually attracted you towards creativity and writing in the first place? Well, um, certainly the arts, um, a major inspiration for me was my, my father, Dhruva Gupta, who um, was a, well, he, he did all sorts of things. He was an amazing singer um, of Rabindra Shungit, but uh, he also was an art um, film critic, a theatre critic. Uh, he wrote himself, he wrote poetry, he wrote short stories, novels. Um, essentially, he um, was an intellectual. Uh, he also taught African history at the University of Calcutta. Uh, that was his day job. But overall, he inspired me in you know, every way possible, just from conversations at the dinner table about the arts, which were not just about the arts, but also about a way of thinking um, about life and, and politics, of course. But um, you know, the facility with which he would just move from writing an essay in, on pre-colonial urbanization in Africa to um, writing a poem just as you know as he felt he wanted to and then he'd go and sing for a bit I mean it was quite incredible growing up with someone like that um, who also of course introduced me to many of the intellectuals in in Calcutta including Shruti Ray so 
you know, I grew up in this sort of atmosphere that was very rich in culture and in the arts. But meanwhile, I always um, felt quite interested, I mean, very interested in the sciences. Uh, at first, it was more of an interest in natural history, but then, I mean, like everybody, I detested mathematics until suddenly, sort of age 14, I realized it was actually another form of poetry itself. And then I became very interested in physics and maths. So when it came to deciding what do I actually want to do, I thought it would make sense to um, study physics uh, or study the sciences and try and keep up with the arts on the side because the other option wasn't, uh, didn't seem available really. I couldn't have studied the arts and done the science on the side. So that's how um, I started off uh, and that's how it's remained. You know, I was hearing this really interesting uh, talk by you, where you were talking a little bit about this, uh, the poetry of mathematics and the poetry of equations. So tell us a little bit uh, about that, like, you know, where do you see and how do you see uh, poetry in uh, mathematical formulae and models? And um, what sure. connects, like, you know, it to poetry? So, I mean, one of the things that I uh, often talk about is how that there's a sort of palpable difference for me in how one, the relationship between the word and also the sentence and, you know, what it's referring to uh, when it comes to the practice of the arts and the practice of science and specifically mathematics. So in one case, the poetry arises from almost from the gulf between the word and what it's referring to or the sentence itself and the situation it's describing, that there is a lot of ambiguity and um, the arts exploit that ambiguity to advance our understanding of, of whatever it is we're trying to deal with. Um, but in, well, in my case, the, I mean, there are also, of course, there are um, people who practice literature in a more, in a different way, but for me, that's what I do. Uh, but in, mathematics it's almost the opposite concern it's how much can you reduce the gap between what you are saying and what you're trying to represent so each word or each mathematical symbol um, has to stand very precisely for something and a mathematical equation has to articulate a point that you know you don't want any ambiguity surrounding that but in doing that, that creates a different kind of poetry, a poetry of economy, a poetry of um, something being in itself, um, it, something reach, seeking to represent in its entirety what it's referring to. So, um, I mean, I think it was Spinoza who said a tiger always wants to be a tiger. So that essence of being, I think, is, is captured in, in the mathematics and the poetry of mathematics. You know, it's really fascinating, like, you know, for me personally, because uh, my company that I run, like, you know, we uh, took a lot of inspiration from the Gaia hypothesis and the Mandelbrot equation and the interconnectivity at, that it brings. And we sort of um, connected back to uh, the world around us and sensors and IoT and all the work that we do. So it's really uh, fantastic when you, uh, you know, compare poetry and mathematics and the world around us. So I just found that absolutely like a delightful. Yeah, I mean, when you speak of the Mandelbrot equation, I mean, that's another thing that um, actually is, 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 is falls out. Um, one of the beauties of where mathematics actually does meet, uh, for me, the practice of science and art, is in the relationship between chaos and order that is articulated in um, the Mandelbrot equations and, and all of those highly reductive uh, constructs, which nonetheless spiral into patterns and forms that are quite complex and beautiful. So linking complexity with simplicity is something that is, is part of that poetry though. Um, I couldn't agree more, like, you know, and especially from a systems thinking perspective, like, you know, we 
sort of try to bring it all together. But tell me a little bit, like, you know, going back into your journey, um, you know, you grew up in this really rich environment. And were you always writing? What were the first things that you wrote? And what was the journey towards the first book? So the first, uh, yes, I was always writing. I'm, I didn't, so in my early childhood, uh, quite a lot of it was spent in Africa. And uh, my very early childhood was very fortunately spent in parts of Africa where there were no schools. So I had this wonderful, until I was six, I didn't have any formal education, which is really perfect. So I didn't know how to read or write. I knew my Bengali alphabet and I knew my the English alphabet, but that was it. But then when I went to school age six and learned to read and write, which happened very quickly, I think uh, that is why I'm not in favor of children going to school too early. So I think if you leave it long enough, it just comes very naturally and quickly. So um, I, well, as soon as I learned to write, the first thing I did was write a story. I mean, a very simple story, but I just remember the thrill that it gave me. And it, it's still, there's definitely a link. It's very similar. That thrill has stayed with me from uh, the age of six, so almost 50 years ago now. Um, so so I, what I was writing at that point because I was in um, Africa, it was English, I didn't, my parents did teach me how to read and write Bengali at home, uh, but I didn't come back. We didn't actually return to Calcutta until I was 11. So um, that's when I started to properly learn Bengali again. I mean, at all. So I was writing in, in as a child does in, in English, little stories for myself. Um, and then I became around the age of sort of 14 or 15, I decided I'd learnt Bengali um, sufficiently well and had been immersed in a Bengali speaking milieu uh, sufficiently long enough to uh, want to write in Bengali. So about that time I started to write poems and short stories in Bengali and some of these um, were science fiction stories and I showed this, I, had, I was enormously privileged to be able to um, show these to Shrotajit Rai, who in fact went, sat with me and edited them for me or gave me suggestions. It was one of the most important um, events of my life, I suppose. Um, and, and then he recommended them um, to little magazines. And, and so I started publishing short stories in Bengali, science fiction uh, short stories um, very early on while I was still in school. Uh, then I ended up through a series of well, unusual events at, at Princeton University. Essentially, my father went on sabbatical to um, Liberia in Africa, and I kind of went with him and from there to Princeton to cut a long story short. Um, and there I, um, well, for three years, I just, I didn't write much at all. But in my final semester, I went, I took a creative writing um, seminar with Joyce Carol Oates and this kind of got me back into writing in English and that's how I started and, and one of the um, short stories I wrote in that creative writing class eventually became The Glass Blower's Breath. Uh, so when I came back to, came, came back, when I came to London to do my uh, PhD I was writing all the t uh, alongside uh, thinking you know I would love to publish a novel and that that was something I really wanted to do. So um, that's how I got into it. It's fascinating, like, you know, how uh, writing is often such a long held dream. And the fact that you had such amazing mentors, like, you know, from Satyajit Ray to uh, Joyce Carol Oates, like, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, it's very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. yeah, yeah. It's uh, absolutely like you know wonderful. So uh, you said that you were balancing education and like you know writing and um, so going back to the first book that you published, which was not like another you know, glass blower's breath, but uh, Memories of Rain, I think uh, was the first one that got published. When I see people like you know like talk about your books, they talk a lot about this floating like you know between magic realism and sort of the realism of everyday life 
uh, using language which is very evocative, but at the same time, like you know, it's um, uh, you know, it's it's very stylized and it's uh, literary and uh, like you know, like transports you uh, into a different worlds. Uh, there's a lot of like you know dreams versus like in you know, a reality. There's comparisons with authors, uh, like you know, really well-known authors from around the world that uh, like you know, your books seem to have drawn. So when you started writing like you know the first book, Memories of Rain, did you actually have some kind of a building block, like in you know, our elements in mind? Okay, I need to position these elements. I need to bring them together. Um, you know, these are my like you know inspirations. From which no, I didn't. Yeah, no, I didn't actually. And, and actually I did. Um, so there's a funny story here in that. So as I said, I started this short story in um, my um, creative writing class. Um, and it at the time, actually, one my one of my aunts, my father's sister, was dying of cancer. Well, we didn't know she was going to die. She died in 88. But um, it, it kind of I think I, we were worried she did have breast cancer and we didn't know at the time we thought she'd survive but um so a lot of it was it was kind of that was the starting point for that story and I started to write it and it um you know it moved along I didn't have any particular sort of sense of a sense of this is what I must do I didn't have any kind of challenge in front of me I just felt I needed to write and this is what came to me when I sat down because for me writing is is a compulsion I absolutely have to do it um so Funnily enough, when I met my literary agent, um, and he, I met him, uh, and he, he said, okay, well, why don't you send me something? And so I went back home and I looked at this novel, which I thought was ready. And I thought, this is awful, I can't send this to him. And instead I sent him the 30 pages I'd read, written of um, Memories of Rain. And that had been inspired, I started writing that about a month before it, um, I met. Mary Pollinger and uh, I'd been to see a play, um, uh, Medea, I'd been to see Medea in a translation of course by Brendan Kennelly and I'd come back from that feeling like I wanted to write about a woman in those circumstances like Medea who is in a foreign land and feels very ill at ease in this situation and, and she is someone with great character and who would have burgeoned but isn't can't when she goes to foreign land she is she stops developing and then she has to tolerate from her husband uh, certain decisions which he put you know he put Jason in Medea for example says look it's a good thing for me to go and marry the princess this will be the best thing for you and our children so you know she's put in this position of extreme weakness just because she is a foreigner. Now this was not my own experience at all, but I felt that I wanted to write about that experience. And so that's how I started to write Memories of Rain. And I'd written only 30 pages of it when I sent it to Murray Pollinger, who uh, he and Gina, his wife, said, yes, please send us the rest. And then I had to write the rest. And there again, I did not have a particular project about how I was going to write and what would happen to the words as they um, were committed to the page. Uh, so my style evolved out of a set of considerations which I didn't, at least they weren't pre-programmed. Uh, I have had always had a great interest and alliance with uh, sort of surrealism and the absurdist movement. Um, so I suppose, you know, part of it did align with that, although not so much in Memories of Rain. I think Memories of Rain was much more about um, music. I must say, I wrote a lot of Memories of Rain with um, tapes on of my father singing Rubindra Shungit. So um, that maybe is what actually comes out maybe in that prose. So uh, that actually like, you know, brings me into uh, like, you know, this whole idea of uh, displacement, right? And you mentioned that you, while it was not your story, uh, you felt that it was important enough to write about this whole idea of the woman who had been displaced from her natural milieu and she was there in a different country, a different culture and uh, trying to find her place in it. And, you know, it's a whole genre of books of authors around the world who are 
um, you know, either living in exile or have lived in exile or have moved by choice into different countries. But, you know, there is a, an emotion that these books carry. So what in that emotion did you uh, like, you know, dig out? And since it was not coming from your personal narrative, um, what was around you, like, you know, that inspired you uh, to talk about displacement, especially of, you know, this young woman from India being in the UK? Uh, what were some of those inspirations? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question and uh, obviously at the time there was this sort of sense of everyone's writing about exile, exile is all. And of course I wasn't in exile, if I wanted to, I, could, I mean I was voluntarily remaining in the UK and at the time I didn't even feel so much that I, you know, was resident here. I, I just felt I was studying and I'd go back every summer every and over Christmas if, if I could possibly do so to, to uh, Calcutta and spent a lot of time you know still being in Calcutta and my parents would come you know I, I didn't feel very much at that point that I was actually living in the UK as a as a resident it was more just as a student so but I think the question of so I've, I've kind of resisted often this sort of label of exile particularly because I think it's um somewhat insulting to people who really are in exile. Um, and so now, of course, I live here, but I don't feel like I'm in exile. I, I feel like a, a guest, I suppose. I feel like a, a foreigner, but it, that's fine. It's, it's, it's quite a good thing to be right now in this country, to be a foreigner rather than a part of the, the current situation. But so I think the answer to the question of why exile is really more that um, sorry, up a bit. that, that um, exile is is a metaphor. I mean, ex exile is something you can exploit. Exile, and we're all in exile. So, in one sense, nobody is in exile, and in another sense, we are all exiled. We're exiled from our past. We're exiled from all sorts of experiences, and we suffer all kinds of injustice and um, imbalances of power. So I think exile is a productive means of exploring that. And, you know, the Medea myth, I think, is a fantastic myth that takes the, the, this, the condition of exile and, and studies it, exposes it and uses it to, to explore the, these power games, you know, everything, the, the network of power that we get caught in. Um, so I started writing it from a, I guess a point of sympathy in some senses, but of course it was a way of exploring um, various things. And in, in fact, in that book, one of the characters I ended up identifying with at some level was the, the husband, the Jason character, who was having was in a position of power, but that also is an uncomfortable position. When in a relationship you realize that you're in a position of power, that doesn't guarantee you happiness. It, it brings with it all its, you know, a various a num number of, um, you know, different problems and anxieties and, and its own sadness. So I wanted to look at it from various points of view. It's very interesting. Now, one thing that struck me, like, you know, as different in your uh, story arcs is that the characters actually go back to their homeland at some point of time and multiple characters do in different books right and which is very different from what happens like you know, in many other books that we do read so uh you know tell us a little bit more about this this notion of living in that flux of being in between identities and like you know, in a different space and then what drives you to go back and what drove you to write those characters and their uh, journeys and their narratives in such a way that they actually uh, took the decision to go back in in, in different books. Like, and you know, I can see that in uh, the Glass Bros. Breath. I can see that in Memories of Marzipan. Even in right. So, well, what, why do why does so much of the actual um, action, if you like, of my novels take place in Kolkata? I think it's because that's the place that is is closest. Uh, I mean, physically, my connections to Kolkata 
um, are, are very, very strong. So I think that's why I feel compelled to um, set my, a, a large part of my uh, writing in, in Kolkata, probably, at, or on the shores of um, Dika or wherever. Um, you know, it, it's pro probably because those places are physically ones that I'm closest to, and therefore I kind of, when I'm writing, I feel more that I can draw from the physical, because the physical, it's like part, I mean, it's, when you compose art, it's part of it, it's like it's a painting, it's sort of why, it's a bit like saying, why do you, I mean, this may not be the right analogy, but why do you use particular colors? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a physical affinity that you feel and then you can exploit that. So, you know, that's why I don't write a book. I don't typically write things that are set, for example, in Latin America or, you know, there are lots of people who do that incredibly well. John Updike wrote a whole book that was set in Africa without having set foot in it. Um, and I'm sure that's an interesting exercise and intellectual challenge. But for me, it, um, I need the book to be, uh, I need to use, recruit my physical experience of a place into the book. So I've just finished a sixth novel and uh, quite a lot of it is sort of naturally set in, in Calcutta, but um, uh, some of it is set on an island in Scotland, which, um, you know, I've visited, there is a, a particular island, which I was very fortunate to visit some friends live there. Um, but it's not as if I spent a lot of time there, but I just feel this kind of a affinity where I can ex use the physical landscape in a way that um, advances what I, the, the narrative itself. And I think a lot of Bengal finds its way into your books, right? Like, you know, from music to not just the physical setting, but the music and the poetry also finds it, its way. Yes, the texture of Bengal is, is very central to my being. So that's why that outpouring, um, you know, involves that. So when you're writing your stories, what comes to you first? Is it the story or is it the character? Um, so typically, no, the characters are much more dominant. So I will usually start with an idea about a person uh, doing something, walking on a seashore, or picking up a piece of glass or, so, you know, something. It, the starting point is usually a person um, doing something. So in Memories of Rain, which was written very much as I conceived it, started with this idea of a woman on a bus on Oxford Street, um, watching birds trying to drink water and, and remembering that her grandmother said that they could only do so by lifting their beaks to rain. And, and so, that, uh, so that was written very much in a linear way, just as I conceived it. Um, in the case of um, A Sin of Color, I actually didn't, I, I wrote it, I changed things around, but it started with this idea of someone coming back to an old house in, um, again, Calcutta, which very much in my head is a house on um, Theatre Road, which my father's cousins occupied. So an old sort of villa, which now no longer um, exists. Um, but so I sort of saw that in a ramshackle way. And because The Sin of Colour was based loosely around um, novel, uh, Rebecca, the Demoria novel. Um, in fact, the way it started was that in 92, when Susan Hill was bringing out her sequel, they asked a bunch of authors what they would do with um, Rebecca as a sequel. And that's how A Sin of Colour started. So yeah, they start in different ways, but usually with an image and usually with a central person. And then the characters, I like to live with them for a while, typically. And then they start to drive the narrative very strongly, actually. So when you say you live with them for a while, like, you know, tell us a bit about how long does it take you to write a book? How long is it in the making in your head and how long? Someone once sent me a message in 2000, I think, <laughs> they were roughly right. They said, look, the space, the first, no, your first one came out in 92, then 93, then 95 then 99 and you know there's this sort of doubling type there which is 
um, he was right about. So that, that's what's happened. But that's partly because of having children and, and not um, having the time and the emotional energy mm -hmm. to um, write. So the first, uh, so Me Memories of Rain was written over three, four months, really. Um, so, and it all came out in one gush. And that central character was there, but there are very few characters. There's just her, really, and, and the husband, really. And the rest are there, but they're all kind of fragments of, in some ways, people I've cobbled together from people I know. So they didn't really get to the point where they started to completely take over the narrative. Yeah. Um, Glass Blows Breath, as I said, I actually started to write a long time ago. So that the central voice there was established a long time ago. Um, and I played around with that a lot. And I didn't know where to position. And then there was a moment where I decided to address her in the second person. And then a lot of things came together. But still that, that novel, I mean, once I returned to it and rewrote it in a completely different way, it took about two or th two years to write. And then Moonlight and Marzipan also were probably about a similar-ish amount of time. Uh, and there the characters did start to suddenly, you know, become very different from the people that I knew or wanted to place. They really started to evolve. Um, and, you know, that, that's how it's been with uh, So Good in Black. I, I lived with those characters for a very long time, especially the central character of Baron Mullick was someone who grew and grew and became somebody a bit different to how he was originally conceived. But um, so there were, and this new one, which I've been writing ever since 2006, the characters have really, really, um, you know, coalesced and developed in, in different ways. And one of the central characters in it is a character that I've written some short stories about. Um, in my sixth book, which isn't out yet. So yeah, they become, I, I quite like this process of having them around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think what's fascinating is that, uh, you know, you have a story in mind for them and an arc and they surprise you, as you said, like, you know, they coalesce can evolve into being different from whatever you had imagined them to be. So explain that process a little bit what happens i mean like you know they're in your mind they're partially on paper and how does that process happen where they actually yes it's very interesting how you know it all finally comes together so essentially it's um well as i said it, it's been different for different um novels but um the characters grow and then, then you keep situating them in different positions and you write bits and then eventually it all comes together. So sometimes, so when I start writing a scene, I will, you know, typically have a character, um, you know, doing something with another character possibly who is already constructed or whom I am uh, constructing, uh, who I'm constructing. Um, and so it's then partly driven by this already established character or the others who are growing or, or new characters pop up as convenient points to, to they just suggest themselves. And then something, I mean, the, for me, the process of writing is very much about typing and watching it grow at a certain level. And then putting the whole thing together, I've often likened to, um, it's very similar in some ways to how you, but a scientific hypothesis together is that you have fragments, you have all these bits and you want to connect them into a cohesive whole. And one of the um, <clears throat> ways that I describe that is with, is by, with reference to something called a perspective box, which um, is this um, object that I encountered some years ago in the National Gallery. And what it is paint, painted in the 17th century when they're all very obsessed with perspective and it's a box where five sides are painted and one side lets in light. And if you look through that side, it looks like a cubist painting. It doesn't cohere at all in any traditional sense. But then there are some holes, there are holes drilled at either end. And when you look through the hole, everything kind of comes together and you see this beautiful Dutch, well-proportioned interior. And 
that's a bit how the I think the, the actual act of constructing a narrative uh, falls to me has there's if there are affinities mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. between what happens in my head and, and that particular process. And that's fascinating. Like you know, a lot of um, authors do actually have a process, right? Like you know, they have a plan. What is um, your process? Is it amorphous? And it sort of like, you know, as you said, coheres at, at some point of time? Or do you actually have a plan that, okay, this is how the story will evolve? Yes, it may, um, you know, surprise you, but do you start out with a plan in mind? And do you sort of try to follow that plan? No, I don't. I really don't. I, I um, sometimes, you know, the, the like something, if, I mean, there are moments. So in writing The Glass Blower's Breath, I was just sort of muddling along with these characters doing this and that. And then at a particular point, sort of halfway through, it did actually something, the ending suggested itself to me, it just became, it kind of revealed itself. <laughs> <laughs> and I, from that point on, I, I wrote to that ending. So it's as if it sort of organized itself. Memories of Rain, I always had this idea that it would just be a weekend and then a short period of time over which she would roughly do this. And, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but with the others, I've had to do a lot of juggling. Um, you know, subsequent to establishing certain characters and and certain writ having written bits of it, then you know, you, you sort of start to piece it all together into the whole, as I just described. So overall, no, I don't start. I have never started with a plot. It's just so, uh, you know, let's stay on the character for a minute. And you have in your books a very strong female protagonists. And uh, there's a lot that happens with them, right? Like, you know, there is, uh, they start out with a certain amount of hope in life. They face some kind of sadness and betrayal. And they are always, like, you know, trying to strike out find themselves in some way. So, so there is a, a growth or a movement that happens with your characters. And how much of that like, you know, really evolves or like, you know, is informed by your personal uh, perspectives on how uh, women should define their role in society or what you see like, you know, holds some women back? Well, I suppose, I mean, with, again, it's book by book. So, um, I, I, I mean, but some of the problems that I tend to, that, that play out through, through women, although, you know, two of my first person characters have been men. Um, so that's, yeah, so it's not always the case. I think one of the things I always say, which surprises people is that, the milieu in which I grew up in, in, in Kolkata, was really quite gender neutral. So, and my father, I cannot imagine him ever thinking of a woman as being, you know, inferior or, or you know, in any way, anything other than, you know, completely his equal, um, as did most of his friends. And, um, and generally, you know, um, you know, I think about of my aunts who were incredible, who, not some of them were very distinguished. Um, uh, one of them ran a cancer, still does, as active in cancer research institute. And yet, you know, others were stayed at home, but that didn't matter. There wasn't this sense of you are defined by your profession. So you were defined by your personality and what you contribute to, you know, life and people around you. And, and so I had, Oh, I was always surrounded by these very, very strong women um, who were full of, you know, they were vibrant, full of laughter. Um, they had the most extraordinary ironic take on life. So there's that. And then, of course, the condition of women in, in our country is, is, of course, appalling, as it is pretty much um, everywhere. 
but but I didn't realize I actually didn't encounter that the kind of sexism that one deals with in um, many settings in in the West until I came to the West. It was when I went to Princeton University and I suddenly realized there were <laughs> some of the fellow students were actually just sort of you know they weren't taking me seriously because I was a woman or their main interest in me was not didn't have to do with what I was um, contributing intellectually. So, um, so all of that was kind of um, surprising to me. And, um, but, but it's not been, having the, the, the politics of it hasn't been something that's been foremost in my head. I think the human condition is what I'm mainly interested in and the way that uh, women have to negotiate, again, the imbalances in power, in um, the, the trajectories that their lives often take. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, the relationship between men and women and women and women, I mean, all of that, I, I do think are, you know, they echo the human condition, but often they echo it in a very particular way in which a woman experiences it. But I also do think largely that it is that the um you know that men also have a very difficult time and in um, uh, yeah i haven't particularly ever felt that i wanted to write about problems that women face even though memories of rain was a situation where what happened to the woman was something that was unique um you know that was very much wrapped up in her being a woman and also perhaps like you know, in your um, uh, marzipan, right? Like, you know, that also had- uh, Yes, a she, bit more of a, yeah. she definitely has um, a very, um, yeah, that the being a woman is a very poignant position and being powerless though. I mean, it's the, the being exploited and, and being powerless or, or not even being exploited, but, but sometimes you're powerless as in Moonlight and Marzipan, the, one of the center, characters um, was made powerless by, um, you know, the, just the way that human emotions work by watching her husband fall in love with someone else. So she was made powerless by that event. And yet, you know, they were both made powerless by that event because that, that, that is an event that does take power away from them. It's one of those like you know like uh, life changing kind of uh, you know moments where things turn. But tell me a little bit about your writing style because it's it's very unique. Like you know the way you're crafting your sentences, they're very long, and there is like you know like phrases upon phrases upon phrases. And uh, you know we spoke a little bit about the uh, Mandelbrot equation, and it's a little bit about uh, you know, the convergences, right? Like, you know, the convergences don't come, like, you know, you keep running the equation and then suddenly, boom, like, you know, it's sort of like, you know, there is convergence and there is a beautiful image that emerges. So your sentences actually, oh, that's of, that's uh, like, you know, yeah. they are, uh, you know, like uh, it's, it's, it's like a tapestry and it's like a, like, a, like, you know, you know multi-stranded sentence, every sentence ends up being Yes, I, I mean, that's, I mean, I'd love to think my sentences were, were fractal, so to speak. <laughs> but but yeah. I think you've hit at a very sort of core element there, which is how to balance uh, abandon and decorum, as Lyndall Gordon very nicely put it, how to balance chaos and order, because, um, ah, I'm on a podcast. <laughs> Topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, how to ban, uh, um, balance chaos and order, I think, is what at some level informs the whole process because it's, um, you know, I want to write in a way, you, you kind of want it to come out, you want it to gush out. And in a way, that's what happened with Memories of Rain. It really just gushed out. But you need to also keep keep it contained. It's in that sort of region where you have containment of 
your gushing <laughs> or whatever it is, you, you want it to be, you want again to tread that very, very narrow and tricky boundary between um, giving up control and retaining control. But I've often also described my, uh, and this is a late something I've understood later when examining my own sentences, I realize that my response to punctuation, for example, is quite visceral. So I've spoken, I've spoken about this before, but so, I mean, I don't like using semicolons when I'm writing. Um, yet I love the way Virginia Woolf uses semicolons liberally as a device. Mm -hmm. uh, I like using M dashes a lot, um, which Emily Dickinson did to very good effect. So, I mean that there are, I think that a lot of the way I write is, um, a lot of the actual construction sentences is, is, is kind of an emotional, the logic behind it is visceral mm -hmm. rather than um, some kind of structured so some cerebral kind of, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, but at the same time, they, that visceral response has to be constrained. So that's why I think, I, I think the fractal, I mean, I'm very <laughs> pleased and, and, and uh, honored <laughs> to, to, to have my uh, work described the way you do it to that particular process. Uh, because yes, that's what, that, that would be the ideal is to, um, get to that point where you have this fractal, this patterning that is complex, but it's a pattern. It's not mm -hmm. an arbitrary disorder. There's another quote I use from Aldo Rossi, which who is an architect, Italian architect, and he talks about avoiding arbitrary disorder. So you want some level of disorder, but it can't be arbitrary. It's fantastic. So I uh, was seeing through some of your articles which are in the scientific strain. And obviously the language is very different there, right? That's the language of uh, um, I mean, explanation. That's the language of uh, like, you know, logic. And then like, you know, you're saying that when you're writing your novels, like, you know, it's uh, visceral and it's emotional. So do you personally go into a different space, like you know, in your mind when you write fiction? And how do you actually like, you know, get into that space? What's that process of getting into that uh, novel writing space in your head? I don't really have a separate space, I don't think. I mean, obviously it is, it might sound disingenuous because it is so different. And as I said, when I'm writing a scientific paper, um, I'm so, the considerations are so different is there and trying to keep it tight and structured and mm -hmm. everything that I do, I do want it to be completely logical completely accessible I mean I, I think I want my writing to be accessible but not at the level of being uh, you know simple and easy to follow I want it to be accessible in the sense of you people being able to use it to get to to use it for their to achieve their own ends of, of um, their own understandings of what I've written. But in when it comes to science, I want it to be completely spelt out. But in, in both cases, there is this need to create something, to, to create a coherent narrative and, and to arrive at some kind of understanding of the system that I'm looking at. So, so I don't have to really switch say, okay, now I'm gonna write in a scientific mode. Now, it's not a switch that flicks. Um, it's, an, it's just like a different language. You know, it's a bit like, again, if you draw, you, you think of the analogy of, of painting or drawing, it's like taking up a different type of pen. You know, you say, oh, okay, I'm, this, this has to be pen and ink. This is gonna be a lot of watercolor or this is going to be oil or this can be acrylic you know it's more like that for me you know you talked about uh you know conveying something when you're doing scientific writing and that's uh you know fairly interesting because a lot of the times people students who are in the scientific uh, fields think that they don't need to write as long as they understand maybe like, you know, the mathematics or like, you know, like uh, the logic behind things, they don't need to write. But at the same time, when I was listening to 
uh, the director of uh, the NIH in the US and he was talking about how a lot of like, you know, what happens in science is about, you know, you need to convey what you're doing to people. You need to build like an awareness. You need to get advocates. You need to get funding. All of that requires an ability to tell a story and tell it well, right? So what's your thought on the need for storytelling in science? Yeah, the, the type of storytelling you do in science is, is typically, uh, you know, it follows a, a, a linear narrative. I mean, now it's increasingly uh, less and less left to the imagination or the will of, of, of the individual. I mean, if you read a scientific paper from the 50s or the 60s, it's, uh, you know, often very personal, very colorful, written beautifully. And now there's just a sort of formula. Uh, so it's become very formulaic how you do everything in terms of laying out your mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate because of course that um, limits the imagination and limits creativity, limits the ability to understand the system. And then, you know, you, there are many crises that have arisen from that, including the most recent, the one that we're sitting in, which is the coronavirus crisis, which a narrative was established right from the start about what happened or what was happening. And we've seen scientists um, failing to budge from that narrative, just won't budge from it. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. obviously they may be right, but the point is that you need to be able to budge from the narrative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's not happened. And you, the other thing that's not happened is an understanding of the entire problem, that it's not just the science. There is, as I say, there's the logos, but there's also the pathos and the ethos within here, which is just being ignored by those who are focused on stopping the number of cases, for example. They're not considering, or haven't been until recently, uh, what should have been taken into account right at the start, Mm -hmm. The measures taken to do that could have significant consequences. Um, so th those sorts of um, lacunae develop from adhering to a very strict and simple uh, prescribed narrative. And the sciences uh, have fallen, the, the scientists by and large seem to fall into those traps because they don't have a proper education in uh, the humanities. I think an education in the humanities is actually essential. I'm not saying it has to be acquired in college itself, but not reading more broadly and not educating yourself to the level that we were certainly expected to mm -hmm. uh, do, whether we're scientists or artists or, or, mm -hmm. or homemakers or whatever, that, that I think is very important. Um, an essential part of citizenship. I couldn't agree more that like, you know, there are multiple perspectives and like we need to think through all of them. And especially like, you know, when we are in those positions of power to make uh, decisions sway a particular way or the other. Um, and, you know, that also has a whole role of like, you know, marketing uh, an idea but getting back into the writing domain of uh, marketing and marketing books. And it's, you know, it's a process and an accepted process that today writers have to do. But what is your take on it? And how do you like, you know, like, um, like what's, what's your take on it? I don't think that the market the, as it is, has been defined or redefined for literary fiction is what I'd, is, is, is the right kind of market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that when I entered the market place, um, it was more of a temple, I'd like to say, um, in the 90s. So it was a sustainable model. It wasn't as if, you know, it wasn't a charity. Grove Press were not a charity and all were around books, but they had a sustainable model whereby, you know, the kind of fiction that I write was not expected to sell in any particular way, but, you know, the, the uh, consumer for that kind of fiction was identified. We knew the limits of that and the production occurred 
and everything, all the remuneration, everything occurred in a commensurate way. So that I was comfortable with, but what happened in about 20 years ago is that somebody decided that wasn't the right model. And so I think that, and this, I'm not saying this from the point of view of someone who doesn't respect that kind of model. For example, one of the other things I'm doing at the moment um, is developing a new type of flu vaccine. And so that we're, you know, we've licensed our uh, technology to a company in the US and they're going to develop it. So obviously for that, a whole different model applies. The model that applies there is very different where I am going to present what I'm doing in a very clear what pathway. There is a clear sense of what needs, to, what kind of, um, you know, pathway that that should take in order to to make it possible. I mean, even there, I'm a little bit concerned about the profit motive, uh, just because I think public health should be outside of that. But so I think the markets for literary fiction should be sustainable, not uh, driven by profit. I mean, in as much as profit is part of the sustainability, that's fine, but I don't think they should be driven by this idea of let's have one big book which makes a huge amount of money let's then talk up the author to be someone a commodity you know this sort of commodification of both the author and the product um just creates uh, i think a, a situation that doesn't for me is not conducive to writing further good fiction it's like the venture capital model that has come into uh, fiction yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm very mindful that you said that you had a hard stop. I do, unfortunately. Uh, you know, uh, just like you know, one last question then, and I know we didn't touch too much upon. You alluded to the fact that you have uh, children, you have a very like you, know, you have a flourishing uh, career in the sciences, and you have a literary career. So how do you balance it all? And like you know, specifically if you were to give advice to uh, young women who want to balance multiple things, our listeners today who are like, you know, young women from different walks of life, what would your advice be to them, like, you know, both from balancing their uh, goals and wishes and vision for their own life and from like, you know, a writing and a um, like, you know, perspective? Well, I think it's, that's a really important question and I've had to think about that very carefully because there are people who've said to me, why do you do both things? wouldn't you be better off doing just one thing and doing it well? And, you know, that's a real, that's a serious question. It's, you know, asked by well-wishers. They're not people who are trying to put me down. And then I realized that that question actually ties in with exactly that which you asked about children and, you know, everything that I wanted to be. I mean, I think most of all, I, what I want I wanted to be or have become, the most important part of my life is my children. So being a mother is the most important thing in my life. And then there are all these other things. So the question was, wouldn't I have been a better mother if I'd just done nothing? Other? Maybe, uh, wouldn't I have done, certainly my literary career, I don't know about my scientific career, but my literary career suffered quite a lot from having to stay, you know, not being able to go out and promote myself and all of that, um, or stay networked. But then the answer to, that question and in the answer to every question that anyone by, might be asking about how to juggle anything is that we don't do any of this in order to do it well that's not our objective we do these things because we feel we have to we do them to the best of our abilities but it's better to do everything that you feel you ought to do slightly less well it's better to endure that uh, and I think that this monolithic kind of idea that you have to do one thing well, again, is something that the market would like you to do, but it's not what, as an individual, you want to be doing. So I think that my bottom, I mean, my last word to everyone would be to pursue everything, all your dreams, and, you know, in a realistic way. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to stop. Uh, playing the violin professionally tomorrow, not that I could if I try, but, but I'm not even going to do that, try that. But so within realistic boundaries, and maybe slightly outside of them, I think you should try and do everything that you wish to do, 
that you desire, you dream of doing, and fulfill all your obligations, of course, to, to those people around you um, as best you possibly can. That's, that's all we can do. Thank you so much. My pleasure.